Hello and welcome to the part one biological rhythms. Um, this is part one of biological rhythms in sleep aka to psychology by revised time vid on YouTube. Biological rhythms are found throughout the living world and it happens to us in ways we might not even recognise. So it's including stuff of changes of levels in brain chemicals and increasing and decreasing of body temperature over a single day. And then there are ones that we probably are more likely to recognise, more commonly known ones, such as the sleep and waking cycle, which we all go through, including all animals. Then there's one that 50% of the population go through, which is the menstrual cycle. And then there's hibernation, one that we don't actually go through ourselves. Well, I do, but um, <laughs> animals go through it really, such as squirrels and hedgehogs. So there are three different types of biological rhythms that you need to know about. There are more, but we don't need to know these for the specification. So the first one is a circadian rhythm, sometimes also referred to as gyneural. And this term refers to 24-hour rhythms, such as body temperature in humans, which peak within 24 hours, and also the sleep-waking cycle, which happens roughly over a 24-hour period. The next one is infradian rhythms. And these are rhythms that have a cycle length um, of more than one day. So it could be a month, it could be just two days. But one common example is the menstrual cycle, which is around 28 days. And then there is the hibernation cycle, which normally is in a periodicity of a year. Uh, but these are sometimes called circannual rhythms, but we only need to know them as infradian. There is then the last one, ultradian rhythm. And these are ones that have more than one cycle during 24 hours. So an example would be the alteration of slow wave sleep and REM sleep during the night. This happens more than once in 24 hours normally. One key question you may be thinking is how are these biological rhythms controlled? Well, it may seem obvious at first because we go to sleep when it's dark and we wake up when it's light. And it's the same with animals. They hibernate when food is scarce and when it's winter. And when birds migrate, it's because it's cold and because food is scarce, again. These observations suggest that the biological rhythms are only controlled by environmental factors. These are known as exogenous or external cyclobus. These are cues in nature, such as light, temperature and food availability, that control our biological rhythms. However, many studies have shown that things are not this simple. For example, if beach living algae are kept in a lab at constant conditions and without tides, they still burrow into sand and emerge at times in tune with tidal flows at their home beach. And it is the same again with squirrels. Kept in constant lab conditions, they still seem to prepare for hibernation as winter approaches in the world outside. They do this by putting on weight and decreasing in body temperature. All of these observations suggest that control of body rhythms is more complicated than maybe we first thought, and it involves more than just these external zygobas. If these rhythms seem to be maintained in the absence of environmental stimuli and cues, there must be something else, something inside, known as an internal clock, that regulates biological rhythms in the absence of these zygobas. This is what is known as an endogenous pacemaker, or the body clock. However, establishing a relationship between these two zygobas and the body clock is hard when we do not still understand in a lot of detail the different types of biological rhythms. So therefore, we'll come back later on in this video to explain these zygobas and body clocks. Now we are going to go into more detail about circadian rhythms. As we said earlier, these are 24-hour rhythms, and circadian comes from Latin for about a day. One main example of this would be the sleep-waking cycle, which happens over a period of 24 hours. Another one is body temperature. This changes throughout the day and has one peak in the afternoon and one trough in the early morning in the same 24-hour period. Also, hormones and neurotransmitters and other physiological processes show a similar circadian variation in activity. And altogether, there may be over 100 bodily processes linked to this 24-hour periodicity. So the question is, why? Well, it all links back to the sleep-waking cycle. For example, nocturnal animals are active and alert at night, but they need to sleep and keep safe during the day. Diurnal animals reverse this pattern and being active during the daytime and sleeping at night. But either way, it makes sense for the body's physiological processes to be in tune with the sleep and waking cycle. 
so that energy is provided when needed. For example, the rising body temperature during the daytime in diurnal animals, such as humans, allows for increased metabolic activity and energy expenditure during the daytime for running and dancing. But then, as night approaches, body temperature falls, and this allows for decreased energy expenditure. The central circadian rhythm in humans is the sleep-waking cycle, and this is referred to later in this video. Now we're going to cover in more detail infradian rhythms. So these biological rhythms have a periodicity of more than one day, such as female menstrual cycle of 28 days and hibernation. So when we first went over this, we saw that um, an infradian rhythm, such as hibernation, would seem to be a sensible adjustment to severe winter weather and lack of food. But then we saw that squirrels kept in the laboratory also show the hibernation pattern. And therefore, we can conclude that it must involve both sight-gibbers and a pacemaker to control this rhythm. In recent years, there has been an increasing interest in a human psychological disorder known as seasonal affective disorder, often shortened to SAD. This is a form of depression that regularly affects vulnerable people during the winter months. In this sense, it is classified as an infradian rhythm. People with SAD tend to eat and sleep more when affected during the winter months. But research into treatments for SAD provides a clue to its cause. For some, but not all sufferers, a brief exposure to bright light in the morning can be effective against SAD. And this links back to external zeitgebers and their effect on infradian rhythms. One effect of light is to suppress the activity of a brain chemical, melatonin, which has a central role in the sleep-waking cycle. Darkness increases melatonin activity, and while daylight reduces it. And these are effects seem vital to the normal functioning of the sleep-waking cycle. There is some evidence that melatonin pills can even be effective in preventing jet lag. People with SAD may be less reactive to effects of light and so their melatonin system is disrupted. The exposure to the bright light in the morning may resynchronize the melatonin system and therefore reduce the SAD. Now we're going to talk about ultranium rhythms in more detail. As you may remember from before, these are rhythms of less than 24 hours in length. The most relevant example is the pattern of human sleep. During a night's sleep, we systematically move through different phases of sleep. We start off at light wave sleep. We then move into deep, slow wave sleep. Back to light, slow wave sleep. And then into a phase of rapid eye movement sleep called REM. One cycle of this, on average, takes 90 minutes. The control of this cycle involves a network of centres in the brain communicating through a variety of neurotransmitters. There are some other examples of ultradian rhythms. Some studies of alertness and attention span in humans show that it can vary within a periodicity of 90 minutes. There is also evidence for a basic rest activity cycle in human behaviour that also has a 90 minute periodicity. So now we're going to go into more about the endogenous pacemakers and the exogenous sight givers. A key issue is how biological rhythms are controlled. They are clearly intended to help us adapt to our environment, and most obviously with rhythms such as sleep-waking cycle and hibernation. But evidence also shows that they can operate in the absence of these environmental cubes, known as zeitgebers. This brings us to the relationship between the endogenous pacemakers and the exogenous zeitgebers. Just to give you a quick recap, endogenous pacemakers are known as internal body clocks. They are inside your body. As regular rhythms of activity can be recorded in the developing human embryo, it is probable that these pacemakers are innate, which means they are inherited genetic mechanisms. Whereas the external zeitgebers are known as time givers. These are environmental cues or stimuli such as light and temperature that play a key role in controlling our biological rhythms. One of the most important zeitgebers is light. And a great deal of research has identified the main pathways involved in linking light to biological rhythms. So now we are going to focus on light, endogenous pacemakers and sleep. There are two key brain structures that are the key to the control of biological rhythms. One is the penile gland. The other is the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN for short. The suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SEN, is a small group of neurons inside the hypothalamus of the brain. 
The electrical activity of these neurons has an inbuilt or endogenous circadian rhythm, and this pattern is maintained even when the SCN is isolated from the rest of the brain, showing that it is truly endogenous and probably even genetic. In fact, several genes involved in the control of the endogenous body clocks have been discovered. For example, the PER3 gene, although their precise mechanisms have not yet been uncovered. A direct pathway links the SEN with the retina of the eye. And the retina is where the light impulses are received and converted into nerve impulses. And this pathway would allow for light input to regulate the activity of the SEN. Stefan and Zucker in 1972 were amongst the first to show the damage in the SCN in rats disrupted a number of circadian rhythms, including the 24 hours of locomotor activity in the sleep-waking cycle. Research study of Stefan and Zucker in 1972. The aim of their study was to find out if the SCN is one of the key internal pacemakers in controlling the circadian rhythms. Their method they studied control rats housed in a lab for 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. These rats showed normal circadian activity linked to locomotion and drinking, with more activity during the night and more drinking during the night, where the night was the dark hours. They then went on to study a group with damaged SCNs, and this, they found, eliminated normal drinking and activity. So the circadian rhythm was eliminated. They concluded that the SEN is one of the key pacemakers in the brain controlling the circadian rhythms. In the exam, in order to gain AO2 marks, you need to be able to evaluate these studies. So the evaluation of Stefan and Zucker's study is... Stefan and Zucker were fair. They also damaged other parts of the hypothalamus to show that this did not affect circadian rhythms and to ensure that it was the SEN that was the pacemaker. However, the surgical procedure was very, very difficult and only 11 out of 25 rats survived the damage to the SEN. So therefore there is a possibility that it was the severity of the operation that affected the rat's behaviour. However, the use of controlled lesions to the other areas, and in fact that later studies confirmed the role of the SEN, suggest that this was not a major factor in this study. Also, this study used rats and not humans, which raises the issue of generalising from rats to humans. Although it is likely that human endogenous pacemakers will be organised in a similar way, and this can only be confirmed by studies on humans. You can also get AO2 points from ethical issues in evaluation. The use of non-human animals involves a balance between the value of the findings to humans and the stress caused to the animal. And the fact that so many rats died in this study is a major concern. It should not really matter that it was a rat and not monkeys or humans, for example. It is highly unlikely that such a study would be allowed today, and since 1972 when this experiment took place, tighter regulations covering animal experimentation have been brought in. So this is the end of part one of the biological rhythms in sleep. I am aware that I've run over quite a lot of time covering these topics, so what I'm going to do is I'm, in the next video I'm going to cover the topics that I've missed in this video, such as ultradian rhythms and the SIFRI research study to avoid making this video too lengthy. So watch out for part two for this and thank you for listening and watching. Please subscribe to my channel.